Today I want to talk about face fond memories. So hopefully what we can learn from this and what I'd like for us to learn from this today is how important it is to share the faith that we have. The faith that we have in God, the faith that we have in, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And when we st stop to think about this, we have to also have to have uh, examples in our own personal life of where God has been faithful to us and we have an appreciation for God's faithfulness. So the question to us this morning is, do we have any fond memories of God's faithfulness in our lives? Um, the first thing that comes to mind, and I've expressed this before, I've told you about this, um, and it's after the fact kind of faith, which is easier for us all looking back than in the moment. Uh, but the reality of faith is in the, the very moment um, that we have faith and confidence in God, even as we look into the future and, again, we look back. But that reality for me was on August 4th, 1964. Uh, that is the day that my dad passed away unexpectedly. And on that very same day in California, they were typing out an acceptance letter for me to go to college. So I got his death made actually made it possible for me to go to college. I don't think I would have gone to college if he had remained alive. I would have felt an obligation to stay at home. Even as it was, I did feel that particular obligation. But on that particular day, I was very angry with God. I was wondering why all this happened, and I didn't understand those things. So... Then also is how important is the faith of Jesus in our life? Uh, Jesus' faith is so different than our faith in the sense that Jesus trusts the Father implicitly in all things at all times and knows that. And so when we look at our faith compared to Jesus' faith, which one of these faiths would we like to, to have? And what can we learn also from the faithfulness of others? I think this is very, very important for us to understand how other people's faith impacts us and helps us along in our road to being trusting in God, believing in God, being encouraged that even in difficult times, God is there for us, that he'll not leave us or forsake us. So I'd like to look at some scriptures in Romans chapter 10, where the Apostle Paul is struggling with the fact that his brothers, uh, his kinsmen, were trying to establish in their righteousness by the law. Um, it is easier to do physical things and to see the end result of it than those things which we can't automatically see. So we can feel good, we can trust in what we know what to do. And that was interesting. I in this particular project, I was trying to figure out the plumbing uh, and how we're going to get that wired up. So I got, got my uh, stepson to come over, who's a, a plumber. And of course, he says, well, we're going to do this, this, and this. He rattles this off, you know, just one thing after another. And, and I've done plumbing, but I have to think it through. And I usually have to go back to Home Depot about four five times to get all the parts because I don't get all the parts but he just wrote these things down the next thing you know he's back we got we got it that the pummeling and we set up the you know all of that because he knew what he was doing and I could trust that he he knew what he was doing I also told him well I trust you a whole lot more putting in that sink than me putting in that sink <laughs> so I think I've kind of talked him into to doing that as well but let's begin here and actually I have verse 6 through 17, but I just do want to kind of give us an introduction to this, where Paul says here in verse 1, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God. 
and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law, so there, there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. So there is a result of us trusting in God, believing in God, having faith in God. So he says Moses describes in this way, the righteousness that is by the law, the man who does these things will live by them. Then here, and this is where I want to start, but the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. And we have to, again, it takes faith to believe that, because we as people are are segregated, we, we're, we're all, individually, we're, we all got it right. And we, we think that we, we have it together. But he's again reminding us we're all one. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can you call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And that's the reason that I'm looking at this day. It's about preaching faith and helping us to understand it. And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now, do not trust in that one for me and the like. If I'm bringing good news, me and my feet or, or something else. But anyway, you, you understand the point there. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. So we want to talk about some examples here that hopefully will help us understanding the righteousness that comes by faith, where we believe in God. Because righteousness begins and ends with God. We of ourselves, none of us are righteous. And with that thought in mind, I want to read Mac's favorite scripture in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 and 21. Because this is important for us understanding about whose faith we have. In verse 20 of Galatians chapter 2, here's what the apostle Paul says to us. I have been crucified with Christ. Now, again, one of the things about faith is we have to understand that faith does not always come without pain or problems or difficulties. Um, That's part of our faith. We trust in God that he knows what he's doing with us, that he loves us. And even though we may feel like we're being crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. So, again, when I think about adventures, doing things, leadership, if I were on a wilderness trip, whitewater rafting or something like that, I'd want to have a good guide who's been there before, has done that, and I can trust that he knows what he is doing. This is important for our understanding because... When we don't know where we're going, and these unknowns, it creates all kinds of problems. Satan plays upon that. I think as we keep emphasizing from the book of Genesis, you know, he he emphasized the fact that, well, you, you don't know for sure. This causing them to doubt, to have questions, and not to trust God. But he's, he's telling us here that he lives in the faith in the Son of God. But not only this, and this is an important thing about faith. Faith in God, and Paul puts this addendum on this, who loved me. 
Now, it isn't just faith in something that is austere, something that is, you know, unrelational or whatever, but it is faith in a, in a God who loves me, and he gave himself for me. Then he says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. It is when we trust in him, we believe in him, have faith in him. So Jesus is an example of perfect faith. Jesus always depended upon the Father, trusted in God. We are to trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus. It is his faith that we look to. It is a faith that delights the Lord because it's, it's a good feeling to know somebody trusts you on, on an issue. I mean, in relationships, when you know that the other person can be trusted, it, it is a delight to be able to, to do that. And that faith that God is a loving, heavenly father. It takes all of those things because some of the examples that we're going to talk about will wonder, well, I, I don't understand how you're a loving, heavenly father in these examples. So imagine for a moment the stories that Jesus would have to tell about our adventures into faithfulness. So we got to look at not just ourselves, but we want Jesus to tell us about our faithful adventures because he's a man of absolute faith. So let's start with an, we'll start with this example of Noah. So here Jesus and Noah are are sitting around the campfire. And we're going to kind of work our way through this. And, and, and Jesus is saying, Noah, I want you to build an ark. And Noah says, well, an ark. What, yeah, what's an ark? Thank you, what's an ark? And Noah's saying, well, it's 120 miles to the coast. Uh, you want me to go over there to the coast and build? No, I want you to build this in the Mojave. You know, for us. I, build, you, you can build. Yeah. Okay, Lord. You say that. And then, uh, now, I'm going to give you, here, here the, here's the blueprint for this. These are the material. And then I want you to go out and gather all these animals together, and you're going to get the animals, and I'll send a rain and all of that, and, and the like. And you're thinking, well, wait a minute, Lord, um, the elephant? I'm, I'm going to get this elephant and the lion and the bear and all of these. You know, they've not been real cooperative. And certainly the goat is not very cooperative or whatever, but, you know, you, I want you to collect these animals. And then Jesus, you know, we're kind of working through this. And this is where you, you begin to have fond memories after the fact. So here, Noah is 40 years into building their ark. He's got the beam going out there, and people are making fun of him. And, and Noah's thinking, oh, Lord, you know, when will I ever get this done? These people are ridiculing me. They're doing all of these things. And then 120 years, and then finally he enters the ark with the animals, and we know the rest of the story. But for the moment, we want to reflect on Jesus and Noah having the conversation, and Jesus saying, Noah, do you remember year 80 when this was happening and this was going on, and you were doing the work, I told you to do. You're, you're sitting there wondering why. Why, Lord, are we doing this? This is silly. This is ridiculous. I'll do it because you told me to do it. I mean, that is a picture of so many of our lives until the rain comes. And then after the fact, when you're floating while the rest of the world, you know, is drowning, you say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. I for 120 years, I did what you told me to do, but I really didn't understand it. And so I can see Noah, after the fact, having, sitting down with his family, having fond memories about God's faithfulness, what God told him to do, and his following through on that. So Jesus sharing 
Noah's human thoughts because Jesus is a pretty good example of knowing what our thoughts are. And then knowing, Noah sharing his thoughts after the fact. Now, there's another example that I want, a fond memory. Abraham and Sarah. Okay, they don't have a fond memory up until. And then here they are, Jesus again, Abraham sitting in his tent, Isaac over there squawking and, and crying and doing whatever Isaac might have been doing as a child. But then Jesus is saying, well, you remember the promise to you and Sarah about, well, you're, you, you'll have children and they'll be as the, the sand of the sea. And you remember what Sarah, what, what was that chuckle all about? What was that laugh all about? Oh, Lord, and it's a fond memory. Lord, look, you know and I know I was an old lady. And you said that, and I thought, this is not possible. And yet, here we sit now, and look at this miracle over here, my son Isaac. And Abraham thinking, yeah, Lord, I was wondering about that. You know, I wasn't a young man myself. But looking back on it, there are fond memories of what God is doing. Then there's Abraham and Isaac. Now this is a, you say, well, how can this be a fond memory? So we got three of them. We got Abraham, Isaac, and Jesus. And Isaac is saying, Dad, remember when we went up on the mountain and, and Abraham saying, how could I forget? Dad, were, were you really gonna kill me? Because I thought you were. And you think, yes, I was. Uh, but d Dad, uh, didn't this seem so foreign that God, you know, the promise God would give to you and all of that, and that you're willing to do this? And here I am gathering wood, thinking, where's the sacrifice? And I'm not looking around. And then Abraham saying, you know, I tell you, when the angel spoke to me and the ram is caught in the thicket there, after the fact, it's like, oh my, God tried me to the ultimate, as it were. Looking back on it, how much I loved you, son, but I, I'm blessed. And then Jesus having a conversation with them. Now, one of, I think, one of the fond, fondest memories has got to be Peter walking on the water. Here's Jesus. Now, they're sitting on the shore and all of that. They're sitting around the campfire eating some fish as, as Jesus might... And Jesus said, well, so Peter, what were you thinking? As if he doesn't know. And he said, well, Lord, uh, I thought I saw you and I thought I could do the very same thing. And Jesus said, well, you know, I, know, I knew you thought that. And therefore, I increased the waves a little bit just to try your faith out a little bit because you see on those gentle ripples or whatever, when you first got out there, you're thinking, I can do this. If, if he can do it, I can do it better and all of that. But Peter, let me show you your expression. Let's rehearse this. I want to just show this again to you. And then they're just chuckling about it. And, and Jesus then saying, you know, Peter, Thank you for trying. You're, nobody else got out of the boat. And it's, it's, it's a fond memory of believing even though we, he didn't, couldn't stay afloat in that particular situation. So we find that. And so Peter and Jesus are rehearsing these memories. And it's now why it is a fond memory is because of the loving gracious nature of our Lord and Savior. That's what makes it so different. It isn't a criticism of Noah. It isn't a criticism of Abraham 
or, or Sarah or Peter, it is, this is the thing about our faith. Where, where Paul is talking about, you know, I have a faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. We have to realize the nature of God and the nature of our Lord and Savior to really have a fond memory. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are another example of this. So I want to read a little bit of that one uh, from the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 3. I mean, here, now, there's, there are several things that are important about this, one of which is this is not just one person. These are three guys, and I think it helps us to recognize when other people around us are faithful, it's an encouragement to us to be faithful as well. So in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 16, we read this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God which we serve is able to save us from it. That's a lot of faith, that God is able to save it. The kicker comes after this, though. He is able to save us from it. And then he goes on to say, I'm, I'm find it here, he save us from it. And he will rescue us with his hand, O king, but even, verse 18, if he does not, if he does not, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. So this is an element of faith, even if he does not. We find that oftentimes true in ourselves individually. It comes faith in terms of God intervening, healing us, and keeping us alive, or we don't. You know, that we have faith in God, that we have a calling, that God knows us, knows who we are. It goes on to tell us a little bit more in verses 20 through 28 here, because it gets worse for them in one sense, in verse, in verse 20. So, you know, obviously Nebuchadnezzar, hot-tempered, it got even hotter for him and the like. He says, and, and he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. I mean, it doesn't look any better for you. It's not like you got all these strong men and you're, you're going to be able to get out of it. So these men wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blaze, blazing furnace. And the king, <coughs> king's command was so urgent that, and the furnace so hot that the flames of fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't these three men that we tied up, threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of gods. You think about, wow, what a message there. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants. Notice here what their faith did to a king. Servants of the most high God, come out, come here. Now, at this particular point, Jesus is going to say, well, why didn't you guys tell him to come on in? <laughs> I can just see God having a sense of humor and, and reminding them, I was with you all the time, even if you get thrown into the fiery furnace. Then there, there are our own stories that we have, our own memories and fond memories of how God has been faithful to us. God has been faithful, brethren, to forgive us. And he's forgiven us completely and totally through the sacrifice of his son. Jesus is a faithful sacrifice for all of us. He has been faithful in not only sending his son, but also sending God the Holy Spirit into our life and being present with us. 
He has been faithful and loving and providing for us. And I know Jeanette and I have had this conversation many, many times. It is hard to believe that through the course of years that we still kind of, we continue to exist. God continues to bless us and help us in spite of everything. God has been very, very faithful to us, and he will be faithful to us. And he is also faithful to those we love. Uh, Imari, you know, it'll, it'll, Something will work. God will be faithful. We don't know exactly what it is. Uh, it's certainly something all of us are always concerned, of, not only about ourselves, but our children as well. And we're f- faithful as we look back upon what God has done for all of us. Because there are so many situations in our life. I know probably 10 years ago, I gave a sermon that was entitled Calendar of Cares in which we put, we listed in the Santa Rosa Church, we listed all the things that we we're concerned about, and then we were going to look at them at the end of the year. It'd be interesting to go back at that list now and look at what God has done for us. And God has been faithful. And then we, we ask ourselves, well, why did I doubt? Well, because we're humans, and we live in a, in a human world, and there's doubt all around us. So going back now to the book of Romans, let's, again, kind of take a look at some of the things that the Apostle Paul is trying to help his brethren understand. In verse 8, he again is telling them and reminding them here in verse 8, but what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. The word of faith is... What, what is preached? We preach and hopefully, and we believe in that the word, Jesus, is faithful. And we have to be reminded of that. And we have to be reminded of the examples. When you look at the, in Hebrews chapter 11, of all those examples of people who did, were not saved. But it would be interesting to look back upon those events. And I was thinking in particular about Stephen. Here's a man who was faithful to Christ, who was being stoned. God opened up the heavens. He was able to see into the heavens and, and, and see godly things. In that very moment, when his faith was being tried, most of all is when God revealed himself and encouraged him and helped him through that particular problem and difficulty. I can just see Jesus sitting down with Stephen and having this conversation about how proud he was of his faithfulness and fondly looking back on his willingness to do. I say fondly because we know the nature of God because on the other side of all of this, we see the incredible faithfulness and the provision of God in all things. So Paul is continually preaching faith in Christ, his life, his death, and his resurrection. With that thought in mind, I want to read to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, briefly just the first three verses here where Paul is talking about that faithfulness and encouragement. He says, Now, brothers, I want you to remind you of the gospel I preached you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received and passed on to you as the first importance that Christ died for your sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised the third day according to scripture, and that he appeared before these number of individuals in the light. This is what he preached, Christ's life, death, burial, and resurrection, and we can have faith in that. So that leads us then to a confession of faith, as Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 10. In verse 9, we confess the faith that we have, That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Not just Jesus, but that he is Lord. And believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is, we have a, a faith in the word 
the Apostle Paul preached. We have a faith in the, the reassurance of Peter and James and, and all of those that saw Jesus resurrected. We have a confidence in that and we confess that Christ is Lord. So that's part of our faith, the confession of our faith in Christ and his saving work. Faith in what God has done and continues to do. Now that faith leads to righteousness in verse 10. Tells us here, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So it is in these things that we, we come to have a faith in him, a trust in him. Then verse 11, as, oh, and I want to, rem, I put it in your notes here. Remember Abraham, he said that he, he had faith and trust in God and God can imputed to him righteousness. We are not perfect. Abraham was not perfect. We are not perfect. But when we trust in him and we believe in him, it's imputed as his righteousness. It's not because we've done some great thing. None of those things. It's because God is a loving, righteous, holy God. And we seek his righteousness. Verse 11 through 13 talks about our confidence and our belief. A faith that brings us a joy. That no matter what happens, and that we put a trust in God and believe in God. Because it tells us in these verses here that God is rich towards those who have faith. God is absolutely rich towards us. And then in this faith, we have a faith to call upon God. And when we think about calling upon God, this we're reminded of. And here's some encouraging things from a previous chapter here in the book of Romans, chapter 8, and beginning here in verse 28. This is the things that we know in faith. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love them, him. In all things, God works for the good, who have been called according to his purpose. You know, it's like Daniel called according to purpose. God brings people out. Noah called according to his purpose. Abraham called. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That we are to be faithful like Jesus has been and is faithful. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? And they're verse, dropping all the way down to verse 35. He again reminds us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And this is a part of understanding faith and, and the difficulties of man. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. And we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, this is a confidence, this is a faith, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height or depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the confession that we have. Now, verses 14 through 16 talks about the importance in the, of preaching and believing in faith. This we know from the book of Hebrews. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Verse 17, he kind of concludes this by saying, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. One of the things that we do and why we get together, we share with one another our faith in Christ Jesus, our faith in God. We share the, the great adventures that God has led us to, and we're an encouragement to one another to be faithful to God throughout life. You know, I'm talking to Joanne this morning on the, on the phone. It's like, as, as always, if you know Joanne, she's positive. She's looking out for other people, doing all these things, even though she's in a very difficult 
situation right now and not knowing exactly where that is going to go. Other than she knows that God loves her, she knows that God has all power in heaven and earth, and God favors her in, in what he is doing and how he is doing things. Even though sometimes, like I say, it doesn't work out exactly as we want it, but we can be sure of this. It always works out the way God wants it. And in that, we know that God is a loving God. So we have opportunity, and I hope that we will be able to share the faith to the glory of God. Because faith isn't about us and who we are. And, oh, and I've heard this, well, if you had faith, you know, you'll be healed of this or that. And, and because maybe one person was, no. It is between you and God, and it is to God's glory. So with that thought in mind, in faith, we pray to God and give him glory. Let's conclude in prayer. Father, we thank you very much for your blessings. We thank you for who you are, your faithfulness. Because as Paul said to Timothy, he reminds us that even if we're unfaithful, you are always faithful in everything. We have a faithful, loving God, which we worship we want to serve and honor and glorify. Thank you, Father. May you be glorified in your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. The world today is a challenging environment for Christian believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Looking for answers? Grace Communion International local churches in Fairfield, Santa Rosa, and Modesto offers a comforting environment for Christians in search of spiritual growth and development. Contact a local ministry. Attend a local GCI churches at the times listed on your screen.